Ah yes, the times we thought we would get one thing and got something else entirely, or nothing at all. Hey folks, Master Coex here. Now one of the things that really grinds my gears within a story is something that we expect to happen or has been hyped up to happen, but doesn't happen. Granted, there are times when maybe that's intentional and part of the overall plot. Toriyama is famous for that, his subversive tactics, which led to surprising us all and engaging moments throughout the story. Something which would make you think outside the box at least, being seen as fresh and maybe novel in an otherwise dull world. That's not what we're referring to today though. What I would like to talk about to you all are the times when those things are meant to occur, but they can't be explained away, or they feel lacking, unsatisfying, or even downright infuriating. Yes, Dragon Ball Z had this going for it too, but Dragon Ball Super was the first Dragon Ball series in which I was actively looking for things like this by the week. And I can name many things that I saw in the series which never got addressed, and maybe didn't even get a cop-out excuse or some kind of vague reason or reasonable conclusion. We'd like to share 10 instances where we got a good old bait and switch, or worst, just the bait. Believe me, there are times like this which really left me angry. Let's begin in no particular order, shall we? I think that's how I'm going to be able to cope. Number one, Vegeta being stripped of his biggest W. Since this one is pretty obvious, I'm going to get this one out of the way right at the beginning. The big elephant in the room, Vegeta getting the win on Frieza fair and square. He had managed to best Frieza not only barely, but he managed to do so convincingly and in a manner which felt truly cathartic curing an itch that had been going on for decades. The moment Vegeta turned Super Saiyan Blue in Dragon Ball Super and Resurrection F, he had begun an onslaught in the pursuit of beating his former master. He was in control, not putting a single foot wrong, not even a single hair wrong. But then Frieza got mad and blew up the planet. We used to do over and Goku tagged in and got the win instead of the prince, who had done all the heavy lifting prior to then. Yes, Vegeta not getting the win is bad enough of a pill for us all to swallow. But for this to be snatched away from us in this blazon manner, it was probably the most galling thing us Dragon Ball enjoyers had to witness in that time frame. Resurrection F, when you look back at it, it's not a good movie. And back then, even then, that ending was terrible. I mean, it was unpredictable, but I, I remember being in the cinema back then. And when Vegeta didn't get the win and Goku came in, everyone groaned. And we still groan. There was no issue with the performance of the prince. He had done the deed superbly, and Frieza had no answer to his assault. Like we said about Vegeta's progression the other week, the writers of Dragon Ball Super were keeping to convention. Vegeta has a moment of glory, making him look really cool, and then he has to be humble and humiliated. It's the law, apparently. And the biggest humiliation to him is to have this time to shine stolen from Kakarot of all people in one of the most bizarre manners possible. In any case, this was a prime bait and switch, but one we already know and loathe. Two, Trunks' fate. Again, this one is obvious, but no less important. The character who had been the idol of many fans from back when Dragon Ball Z first aired in Japan and then in the West. Trunks, put simply, was cool. He was the 90s and he looked like a total badass. He had a cool theme, even though it was mostly plagiarized, a cool legacy and heritage, and his progression from boy of the future to the hero of the future was excellent. Even in Super, there were moments where Trunks looked great and carried himself with respect and aplomb. Despite the fact his overall sense of hope was not as potent as it once was, but hey, he was older at this point, and maybe a little less optimistic understandably, considering he had years of pain thanks to Goku Black. The main issue comes after Trunks gets the theoretical win, or final blow, on Zamasu, scattering his essence across the planet. Granted, he hadn't destroyed Zamasu entirely, but there was a means to finally end him, but it got them taken way out of proportion. Zeno came by at the request of Goku, thanks to that button, destroying the entire reality of that timeline. That's just, that's just, why? Episode 67 of Super has gone down in infamy amongst the fans as being one of the most rage inducing of the series. And no amount of serious Gohan giving me false hope will make me think otherwise. Trunks' story could have been wrapped up more neatly and Zeno's power could have been used a little more appropriately, but no. Trunks' legacy and everything that he had fought for was stripped away. Like, the last 20 years had never happened. And now, he has to live with his partner in a universe where he doesn't belong. What kind of an ending is that to Trunks? And it's clear we're never going to be seeing him again in the main timeline. I mean, I know I shouldn't say never, but 
why would there be the point to do that? So unless you're bringing the game law into the main law, which I very much doubt is going to happen outside of Super Dragon Ball Heroes. Let's move on. Number three, Krillin's big power up. Ah yes, this. Before the universe survival arc began, there was a two-parter episode which detailed Krillin's struggles to remain relevant. Sure, he had the most stable family in the series and a good job, but that clearly wasn't enough for him. He had lost his way and he had lost confidence in himself. For years, he had been a member of the Dragon Team, but now he felt like he was, at best, on the periphery, or worse, totally irrelevant. In Goku and Krillin's journey through the forest, Krillin was able to rekindle his love for fighting and martial arts, discovering a hidden power within himself which allowed him to conquer over his internal demons. It was, looking back on it, a rather touching episode, and it was pleasing to see he and 18 sharing a moment of pride and satisfaction amongst the otherwise prideful Saiyans. So, you would think that with this new boost in power and reattuned focus, Krillin would have done well in the tournament. No, that power never rose up again. Krillin resorted to using his comedic guile instead to best Majora, which was fair enough, and when he felt good about himself for defeating a foe, Frost came in with a hit and took him out. He was the first one out of the tournament for Universe 7. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I get that Dragon Ball has humorous outcomes for things, but that wasn't funny. That was nasty. That was mean-spirited, and it made me furious, and don't get me started on what Toyotaro did. Granted, Krillin's plucky attitude to take part was still there, but the fact that he had found this new inner strength to carry on was not utilised properly and barely noted? That's just tragic. I would have been okay if he was out in the first half of Fighters, like maybe 8th or 7th. And I know he's not the strongest out there, but he surely shouldn't have been the first one out, or at least not in a manner so instant and sudden. To me, that was probably the biggest bait and switch, but again, there's no particular order here. Number four, Yamcha. That was just sad. Oh, Yamcha. What happened to you was just terrible. Him being made into an absolutely desperate fool, even more than usual. Him clamouring for a role in the team and the others just ignoring him despite his bizarre bravado. They took him seriously when he was being hard to get about going, huh, I didn't want to be in the team anyway. Please. But that didn't leave a chance to prove himself. That just left him alone in his apartment, waiting for the call-up that never came. And what we got was Freezer. And yes, I know, they did manage to pull off the impossible, Freezer's gambit in the end, but at the time of the reveal in the story, that went down like a lead balloon, and Yamcha's place, which looked okay after his baseball episode, had never looked so meagre and feeble. It's a simple point, but one I felt like addressing. Number five, Freezer's opportunity to bring down the gods. Now this, this is the biggest missed opportunity or example of a bait and nothing. In the lead up to the Tournament of Power, Freezer was very keen to make use of his newly minted relevance. After being brought back to the plane of existence for 24 hours, he had decided to showcase his powers and talents, trying to undermine the very beings which had theoretically placed him within his own personal torture chamber. He started off well, terrifying the likes of Universe 9's G.O.D. and Angel, even though that's not exactly hard to do given, you know, Rowan Sidra, and almost even gets the gig as their new destroyer, just through simple fear and bargaining. If Beerus hadn't intervened, that might have led to something big, like what Giorno did to the mob in Jojo. Maybe we'll make a what if about that someday. What if Frieza became the Universe 9 destroyer? Hmm. As you know, Beerus stopped Frieza's power play, but Frieza vowed revenge and to bring down the gods from within in some manner, and that's not gone anywhere at all. Not once has Frieza brought that up. He's been too interested in taking over mere planets and going about his business within the universe like he'd been doing all his life. His routine has essentially gone back to normal. He doesn't seem to be wanting to bring down the likes of Beerus and Whis anytime soon. No, no attack on the heavens, no plan to usurp them, none of that Universe 9 nonsense, just the usual rigmarole of conquering planets and doesn't afraiding of anything. For me, that was a bad miss. But we might make use of this trope for a future what if. You'll see. Six, wear golden frost. The role of Frost in Super is just pathetic. Instead of being a true antithesis to Freezer, like what we did in our What If Frost Was In The Jerk series, link up top, Frost turned into a bungling mess of a character. He wasn't even fueled by malice and revenge like his Universe 7 counterpart. That was a noteworthy bait and switch as well as an example of Classic's version. Frost was portrayed as a crook, 
still a bad guy though, but barely had Frieza's charisma. But surely he would have learnt from his experiences against Hit and the Universe 7 team. He was still pretty cunning though. What we could have seen from what we saw at the end of the Universe 6 tournament was maybe the chance to see Frost become more of a Frieza-like entity, learning from his mistakes, building himself up, climbing the ladder, but no. We got a snivelling, we got a snivelling little toady who was terrified for his own life. If only that turned out to be a ploy, that he revealed a golden power, trying to pretend to be meek and feeble, but otherwise training in the background. Golden Freezer vs Golden Frost, anybody? It seemed inevitable to us back then. Golden Freezer had come about, and Frost seemed to have a similar power set to Freezer, basically a replica, so it'd only be natural, right? Wrong. Frost got erased, and we've never seen him again. Not even in the manga. He's a ghost. A turd. In the wind. Number seven. Skinny Boo. Skinny Boo! Looking at you. Okay, aside from Trunks, this is the most egregious bait and switch I saw in Super. Margin Boo, for a while at this point, had been mostly irrelevant. His place in the story had been concluded long ago, and he could just live out his existence amongst the Dragon Team and be a comedy relief. And to be fair, this was resolved. We did see him gain relevance in the Moro Saga. And in a very spectacular manner too, I must say. Very, very good. But at the time of the anime in 2017, we didn't have that crumb of comfort to look into. Instead, we got a decent inclusion of Boo in the exhibition match, where he then went on to train. And we got this. A super skinny Boo. At last! Boo that we knew had some kind of meaningful progression. And a very physical one to boot. Oh my. He had gained the gusto and vigour to fight amongst the front line, playing again. And with his power and healing skills, he could have been a formidable part of the Tournament of Power roster. Frieza would have been completely unnecessary. But maybe that's the reason. Boo is kind of broken. So instead of the incredible sight we saw in that episode, we saw Boo regain the weight and be asleep. We got the rug pulled from underneath us for the sake of a gag that had been done before in the exam for Universe 6. And even then, that wasn't funny. It's not funny! Here, it was downright insulting. Boo needed something to move its character along. If we had a chance to reinvent Boo into a more enthusiastic and dynamic entity of himself, while still retaining his childlike glee and innocence, it's not exactly possible, that would have been a nice evolution. Make him have something to do. It didn't have to be much, just enough to count for change and not going stale. The only reason I'm not so mad about it now is that the Grand Supreme Kai's role in his psyche was conducted so expertly that I can sort of forgive this once more frustrating moment in Dragon Ball Super history, but still, looking back on it, it still makes me annoyed. Number 8. The Grand Priest's Role From all of the boarding and composition, it was made to look like maybe, perhaps maybe, there was some sort of grand plan being hatched by the Angels and the GP himself to usurp power from Zeno. There wasn't much to go on at the time, but you could sort of feel that something was amiss, bubbling up behind the background. That there might have been a bigger story about to reveal itself in the fullness of time. The entire purpose of the tournament changing completely. Something into a position where the competitors and entrants into the tournament would have to band together to stop the GP and his plan. To save reality as we knew it. But then we got the call in January 2018 that the series would be wrapped up. So when you look to episode 125 next, you could seriously tell that things were kicked up a gear, sped up. They wrapped up the ending as soon as possible. Things then started to move at a breakneck speed. And I gather that the plot that was originally meant to play out didn't occur. And so we just got more basic and simplistic conclusion. Which wasn't bad, I'm not saying that it was bad. But what I meant by this is that it seemed that the GP and his children were orchestrating something that the mortals had no clue of. Something about the likes of Zalama, Zeno, and even some of the universes that were previously erased. It would have been curious to see the intricacies of this governance, but alas, time and ratings were against Super, so we got a switch to a more formulaic conclusion. Number 9. Roshi's Reformation What reformation? If Argentinian television is anything to go by, Roshi is very much a persona non grata right now. His antics in episode 89, you know, the Yuren Ten Shinhan episode, were beyond the pale for their censors. And to be fair, they weren't wrong. It's gonna give Toei and Shueisha a lot of headaches. I mean, even I felt very uncomfortable watching him train with Poir. Like, was it really necessary to show that other than for some cheap gag? Yes, I know, Japanese tastes and practices are different to other countries, and most of the time the Japanese carry on regardless, despite the world actually telling them to, you know, not do that, not caring about what the rest of the world thinks. 
But now they kind of have to. Dragon Ball isn't strictly Japanese anymore, it's global. It has to cater to as many regions as possible whilst remaining true to its original MO. And hey, if it means that Roshi has to be sidelined or changed a lot, then so be it. However, there was a point. The intention was to lead Roshi away from that lifestyle, eschewing his base desires of old, and instead entrenching a new and more moral mindset. You know, not being creepy. It actually looked that it worked. A more sated Roshi, a more cunning Roshi, and one with a great send-off in episode 106. Fast forward tomorrow though, and his old ways have come back. For a gag. Oh, Toriyama, Tori if you're going to keep Roshi in the series and not have regions and people objecting to it, just stick to what you had in mind in the Tournament of Power, please. Make him not, you know, a lech. It's a disappointing bait and switch, but more of a letdown, to be honest. Number 10. Universe 3 Strongest Fighter Eliminated Quickly. Nigrishi, the strongest of Universe 3, a hybrid of technology and organic material. He looked menacing. He was hyped up as being one of the MVPs for the Tournament of Power. He had speaking lines. To me, this was rather good. We were seeing a universe rise to the occasion in a manner which was curious. Another interpretation of the biomechanical warrior we'd seen previously with Cell. But what we got was not that. Not at all. Negrishi was out thanks to Kaba. Kaba. And he'd even barely put in any effort in flinging Negrishi out of the ring. In the manga, he was just a body in a massive event that took out multiple competitors. He didn't even get a single one-on-one -on -one ousting. To me, it was jarring. He had been given a speaking part prior to the battle which had implied, like with Universe 11, that he would be an important example of a strong guy from Universe 3. Heck, he was the team captain! But that was a red herring. Or robot herring, more accurately. And yes, Paparoni did raise the reputation of Universe 3 with Aniraza, but Negrishi should have been the main component of that being and not Paparoni. It felt weird. Hey, I mean, at least we got a kaiju out of it. But what did you folks think? Were there other examples of bait and switches in Dragon Ball Super? Were there even instances of just pure bait and no payoff at all in your own opinion? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I'll see you in the next video. Catch you later.